Harper, you, are you ready to go to work? I'm ready to go. Excellent. Our next speaker is Oliver Roche Newton, who will speak on Elikis Sabal and some products. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Melia. Of course, I will start by thanking the organizers and particularly you, Mel, for, the, for the, what must have been a huge work putting this enormous conference together. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to talk about two uh, two problems and relationships between them. So this is Elika Sabo problem, which I will introduce at the start of the talk and will be familiar to many of you. Some product problem, which I think is familiar to many, many people here. Um, the two problems are connected in the sense that a lot of the things are working on both, the techniques are kind of similar. Um, I want to try and establish a, a firmer logical connection between the two things. We're using this Elikash Sabo theory to, to help with this some product, new information on some products. Um, so let me start by, uh, yeah, so I'm going to start with uh, the brief introduction to the Elikash Sabo problem, maybe not so brief actually. So the question we're concerned with is that we've, we've got some polynomial little f here in two variables over the reals. And some um, finite sets are that they should be subsets of the reals. There's the first typo and the second one. Um, a, B, C, and uh, sets of real numbers of, of the same size n. Uh, we would like to know how large can uh, can this set be? So the number of triples which satisfy this equation, C equals F of A, B. Um, so you can, well, we can a bit more general as well and talk about a, a formula of three variables which in a sense is what this is really and then we're talking about the zeros of this polynomial so big f of a b c equals zero how many of the triples how many of the n cubed triple will realize this identity? so geometrically you can think of this as a as a question about the intersection of a cartesian product a cross b cross c with a polynomial surface. Okay, so an easy bound is that if context, an easy bound is the number of solutions is at most n squared times some uh, factor of degree of the polynomial f. This is just because if you fix two of the variables, there aren't many c. But if you fix a and b, there aren't many c that will work to satisfy this. Um, not many means the degree of f. Um, so there's not much to that. And on the other hand, you can realize this uh, inequality, this up down, quite easily by taking some simple, some simple surface like uh, little f is x plus y. So we've got x plus y minus z equals zero. And um, then if you take your set to be something with arithmetic structure, like say, you take them all to be the first n integers. It's not too difficult to calculate that you can get about n squared solution in this case. So this matches the, uh, here up to the up to the degree, which in this case, since the degree is one, they, they really match. Um, yeah, and another kind of another case where this easy bound is tight is, is the following. So uh, a simple polynomial f x y is equal to x times y, and then if we take a Geometric progression it turns out that we're counting solutions to this multiplicative equation. And yeah. again, we can get about n squared solutions. So we're kind of seeing already maybe a hint at something, some product going on here because we've got two, identified two key um, examples, one being a simple polynomial defined by addition, and the other one, a simple polynomial defined by multiplication. Um, and there are lots of other degenerate examples which more or less come from one of these two and making some small changes. These are the degenerate cases. If, if f, the little f or big F is, is somehow far away from these cases, it turns out we can do better. This is the elikash sabo um, problem, the elikash sabo theorem. We prove the following, we can get much better bound as long as we're away from one of these two uh, nasty cases or degenerate cases. So they prove that there's some positive gamma, such that the only A, B, and C of the same size, 
number of solutions, the intersection of the surface with this grid is bounded by about n to the two minus uh, gamma. Some polynomial saving, trivial. Okay, so that's that. And what does it mean? I guess I, I should say what I haven't defined what non-degenerate means here, so I should be a little bit more precise about that. The degenerate means I'm just going to define it in this easier case when big F is uh, it can be written as can be written in this form. So we've got z equals f of x y is the thing we're solving. So you can always do this, but you can't always guarantee that little f is a is a polynomial. It's be easier to say the definition of generacy. And what it comes down to is that whether or not there exist these univariate polynomials such that one of these things happens. So here we see the two things from the previous slide, the two polynomials from the previous slide. Uh, generalized versions of them, for example, x squared plus y cubed, and then you take a kth powers of the whole thing. This will still be degenerate because you can arrange, you can choose a so that the um, g1 of x turns out to be an arithmetic uh, And so on. So this is actually quite, quite a nice, neat description here of the bad cases. All of these really, you can't expect, you can't get anything for any of these examples. As long as you're not in one of these cases, you get some, you get some saving. Um, so this was improved. Um, this changed the statement here. Now it's the Brasher Cholmoshi Dispute theorem. This is two theorems kind of stuck together, two different papers by combinations of. And yeah, so basically, this what was previously some unspecified positive constant is. Now I'm going to leave one thing. So the exponent is 11. Right, so I want to try and use this. Um, well, maybe I'll say, first of all, what could we, uh, what could we hope for here? So we've, we've got some concrete saving of one sixth, and maybe it's interesting to know what you might hope that this red fraction could be in the best case. I just want to quickly mention a, a construction of uh, a joint work with me. Many McCool, Audi Warren, and Frank Dizdu, where we, we showed that the best you could hope for in this theorem would be something like n to the three half. Um, so we give a construction where the number of solutions, the number of realizations of this is as, as large as n to the three half, which was maybe a little bit surprising because it had been sort of suggested in the literature that the, that the right bound for this problem could be close to. Actually, the construction is very simple. Maybe, may, um, maybe people haven't thought about this very deeply because the construction is there's really not much to it. Um, it's a simple quadratic polynomial here. Turns out that this is non degenerate according to the definitions on the previous slide. And um, yeah, if we take just the first n integers, and if we Focus on a particular subset of a cross a cross a. These triples here, so k is ranging over the first n over two integers. L is um, up to over to root n. So all of these uh, entries here are going to be in are going to be less than n. And it turns out that they're all distinct, and they all satisfy. Uh, they all solve this. So there's a nice simple solution. A nice simple uh, construction. So we have that the number of solutions is at least n to the half. And the question, I guess, going forward is, uh, can this construction be improved? Or uh, can the theorem of Raz and co-authors be I don't know the answer, but I would be more inclined to guess that, the, uh, that, the, that this has a better chance of being tight than the theorem of, than the theorem of Raz and um, but this is really speculation, so uh, I, I suppose there's no scientific reason for this guess. It's just three halves is a nice fraction. Uh, not much more to it. 
But I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone could do it. add a log fact for this or something. Some theory. So that's maybe some people here have some ideas how to do better. They're all this is very simple. Anyway, that's not really the point of the talk. Um, what I'll mention briefly, <clears throat> briefly is a kind of motivation for why we should care about this problem anyway. Usually it's because of geometric application. Today I'm going to talk about some product applications. Let me just make this nice uh, geometric application. It's really beautiful ethics. The beautiful results arising from this uh, Alakash Sabo. And there's a couple of them. Really, well, a lot of them are concerning distance problems. Theorem of Korea, Chef, and Shonamushi, which actually predates Theorem of Razita. It says that if you take two sets of points and they're on both on lines P, P is contained in L1, Q is contained in L2, and the lines have to be um, non, uh, not parallel and not perpendicular one another. And it turns out that you get, you look at the set of Euclidean distances determined by points from one set and, and one, one from one set and one from the other, you get something super linear here, end to the I suppose you could say this is much better than the bound which comes from the cat's theorem. Of course, it's a different problem. We've got a very restricted set of points. Um, but yeah, you get something super linear with such a restrict. Quite comfortable, quite nicely as well. Another one which I like, uh, that's a, somehow a harder problem. I don't know. Uh, that's not fair, but so we, we have here a set of uh, this reminds me of the pin distances problem, but it's somehow harder than the pin distance distances problem, kind of hard enough already. So we've got a set of endpoints in the plane. P. If you fix any of the three points, as long as they're non collinear, then this Elikash Sabo theorem guarantees that at least uh, one of these points determines many distances with this whole set. So more than uh, P to the power six of 11. It turns out that one half is, is um, and kind of easy, easy to get, and this improves the one half. So, so. so yeah, I like this, I like this application. There's many more out there. Uh, okay. Right, so, since we're talking about geometry, I thought I should include a, a vaguely relevant picture here. So, the purpose of this picture here is to show that this theorem or this inequality here you really need three sets. Two is not enough. So, the reason is that if you just stick any two points P1 and P2 down to begin with, start drawing circles around them in such a way that they all uh, that every pair of circles intersects each other each circle centered at p1 intersects each circle centered at p2. and then you define a point set to be the intersection sorry i jumped ahead we define a point set now p to be all the points where these two families of circles cross one another we have about root n circles for each Point, we'll have about n intersections and we'll have only root n distances from each of the points. So, without uh, with only two points, we can't improve on this trivial root p. And there's a good chance to advertise the talk tomorrow by Mandy McCool, and he's talking about some work we did together with also Sophie Stevens and Woody Warren. I thought it was interesting, one of the things we discovered in that paper was that if you restrict the point sets to be rational, so in Q2, then actually two points will suffice for such an inequality. So basically this constriction here um, the points that we get aren't rational. It can't be, well, there can't be too many rational points. 
such a such a picture as this of the intersection. This is this is actually conditional on the on the uniformity conjecture. So conditional on a very deep and difficult conjecture. It suggests that these problems over over the reals and over the rationals are actually probably different. More often, many of McCall's talking about this paper. I don't know if he's talking about this particular application. Okay, so let me get to the other um, problem which was mentioned in the title of the talk, the product problem. And I don't want to dwell too much on the on giving the background for this problem because we have a lot of experts. I'll just quickly throw down some of the usual definitions. We've got the fun set and the product set. This uh, wonderful and very probably very difficult, but I think it's fair to say it's a very difficult conjecture of Erdos and Semerini, which is that either the sum set or the product set essentially as large as possible or very close to the maximum. And as you probably know, this is a wide open problem, 40 years. It used to be nearly 30, it used to be 30 years, but now it's 40 years and 10 years have gone and we've managed to shave a little bit off the thing. We've managed to move a little bit forward, but really not very much. So the current state of the art bound, but this quality of Misha Rudev and Sophie Stevens, which says that one of these sets is at least as large as uh, the, the size of the original set, to the power four thirds, a little something, something here is there. Two over one one six. So four thirds was proven by Sean Moshi, beautiful argument, and uh, refined and improved by Bredoff using also beautiful argument. So. And um, yeah, there's been more progress. In that. So this is where we are, and it's hard. So I don't have anything new to say about this. this problem. Not right now, anyway. The problem that interests me is the, the graph. So the version of this problem where you restrict the sums and products that you consider. We define usually this is referred to as graph. Given a finite set A, you can specify some subsets of A cross A. And you can think of it if you like as the edges of a of that graph. And then the sum set restricted to A is defined as defined thusly. It's all the sums where the pair A B belongs to your specified G. And, um, and the product set A times A restricted to G is defined in the same way. It's all products where the pair is in your fixed G. And you can ask the same kind of questions for the sum set and product set restricted to G. How big is this maximum? So yeah, you could think about G. I'm thinking about G here as being fairly sparse, like fairly, fairly small subset of A cross A. G to be really big, so you could take G to be everything, and then you've just got the, the same problem applied again. The question of boundedness is just error similar. When G A cross A. And when G is close to A cross A, um, it might be a very similar problem. G has size you know, A squared over two or something. Probably more or less equivalent. Interesting things happen as it gets smaller. You start to get interesting constrictions being existing. And I'm particularly interest, interested in the regime where G is having size around A. Size of A. So about the square root of the maximum distribution. And there's another kind of context trivial bound, which is that one of these sets is always at least as big as G. I'm not going to prove this, but I can tell you it's a simple argument. That there's not much to prove. If I had, if it wasn't a 25 minute talk, I would quickly sketch, I would quickly jot down the proof. You'll have to trust me that it's an easy one. 
So the question really is, can we improve on this actual uh, easy, easy result? But this uses, I mean, this uses not eliminate. But can we do better? Um, the answer is actually no, in general. So if, if it is quite small, we can make construction where the subset and the product set restricted to G and we have side root G. I'll mention a couple of constrictions now. Constriction of G and which gives us uh, square roots to the A sums of square roots, sums and differences. We define G to be, well, we define G like this. So we've got square root I plus square root J, and then the um, it's paired with the time minus root J. Okay, so it turns out that if you calculate the size of the subset, well, there's a nice cancellation, which means that the, you're going to get about N of these values. And here A has size N squared, and so does G. A has size about N squared, but the subset are restricted to G, you only get about N. And uh, the products are restricted to G. Again, there's a cancellation, which means that there's only about N of these values too. So N here is root G, and we have not improved, we cannot improve the inequality in this example. So that might well be just because G is rather sparse here. I'm not sure if such an example exists. I don't think that such an example exists where G has side bigger than a to the one plus epsilon question prove a non-trivial bound for the for sort of the right threshold after a certain point we should always get non-trivial bounds and find this point um, okay so there's another kind of geometric restriction which is a little bit like the um, analogous with the picture I Expecting circles. In this picture, you just start drawing lines with slope minus one, and of the form x times y equals some constant. Take the intersection points, and this will be the points here. And the way that this is being constructed, the, the sums along g are going to be uh, bijection with these lines, the products along g are going to be bijection with these hyperboles. And it turns out that kind of homology occurs and root G, we have root G sums. Okay. Maybe so we didn't succeed with the attempt to get something better than trivial for this question. And what I thought could be interesting was to introduce a third set. Maybe with three things, we're guaranteed to get some. What about if we add a different set to the question? It could be a question mark. For instance, can we get a bound? So for the maximum of the uh, some set, product set, and different set all along these three, um, all along these this restricted graph G. And a bound, I want something better than a half. So a half G. Is such a statement true? And again, actually, the answer is no. So if we go back to that chunk construction and we do the calculation, again, there's a there's a cancellation which works there to the number of differences is about root n. But sorry, it's about n, which is about g. I say about it's actually equal, which is about root g. So even with these three sets, we can't do better. And what I wanted to as a kind of a new result, actually, it's just already been published, so it's not so new. Um, which is that we can do better. We can think of a minus a as a plus a dilate of a. So it's a plus a dilate by minus one of a. Um, if you dilate by anything else, it turns out you can get some improvement. So this is a, uh, if you have this, any graph, any subset of A and sum of lambda, which is a dilate, and it should be 
in the reals, but not equal to minus one. Um, also not equal to zero and one. I'll explain why. Then the maximum of these three things, the sum set, the dilated sum set, and the product set, it turns out, do get some better part of the experiment. So I thought this was quite nice um, because we can describe exactly with this particular with this combination, we can describe exactly when it works. You definitely get something for this lambda anywhere but minus one, zero, and one. And we definitely don't get something when lambda is one of these three values. Because when lambda equals minus one, we're, we're in this case. When lambda equals plus one, we only have two maximum. Um, I, I guess actually if lambda equals zero, then you need to kind of define what this means. And if you define it carefully, actually this theorem quality. And yeah, I've run out of time as I expected to right now. I just want to say that the connection between these two things is that the proof uses the Elekash Sabo theorem, which has version due to Raz, um, Shuri, Shalomashi, and Dizio. So the proof is a fairly, fairly uncomplicated application, I have to say, of the Elekash Sabo theorem. Turns out that there's a degeneracy in the polynomial that's generated. And it comes to one. So that's uh, about all I had time for. No time to sketch the proof as I as I expected. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Um, we have a couple of minutes if there are any questions. And I see in the Q of A. Uh, there are so let me try okay so I sophie see. you can ask your question live and uh oh yeah maybe i can i can read I, I can read sophie's question um yeah so could you replace a a with a over a with your techniques um is what she asked and the answer actually is no it turns out that that the um the proof doesn't work. The polynomial that's generated is, is degenerate in the Elikash Sabo sense. And um, actually, there's a there's a construct. You can I can make a construction which shows that it shouldn't work. So no, it's quite kind of a firm no for question one. There's no such version of this theorem possible. Which is kind of kind of kind of strange. I mean, these things are quite delicate. Actually. Arguments quite delicate. Um, you change certain things, it, it just can't work. But then if you change other certain things, it, it does. It's not so easy to sit. I haven't found like the rule for what combinations of three operations will work. Um, and uh, you're, Sophie also asked about different sets. Um, yes, this this theorem works with A and B, two different things. And Audrey asked about. Um, same question for triple sum triple products. I think it makes sense to ask that question. Um, I think you'd probably end up using a, a version of the Alakash Sabo one more variable. Uh, and my guess is if you get some kind of doing this same sort of proof but you uh, that theorem. So I'm not exactly sure what pops out. It's, it's a sensible question. Oliver, thank you very much. Thank and, you. And uh, our Harold will be our next speaker. Harold, if you can share screen with your slides.